This episode is brought to you by the Arvada Center. Relax under the stars at the Arvada Center's outdoor amphitheater with their summer concert series running now through September. This season features big names like Melissa Etheridge, Tower of Power, Preservation Hall Jazz Band, Spin Doctors, and so much more. Prime MTV. Cracker, Spin Doctors. You know what? Melissa Etheridge was in there too. She doesn't get enough credit. Actually, I'm going to go to that show too. Put that on my calendar. For tickets and a full schedule of live concerts, visit arvadacenter.org. That's arvadacenter.org. Hey, Denver, it's Paul. I'm a producer on the show, and I'm back with another installment of our limited run podcast series about all things Lauren Boebert. If you haven't caught the first two, I'm going to put some links in the show notes, but I am so excited for you to hear this one. It's all about what the Congresswoman has actually done as a legislator because that's the job description after all, make laws, but specifically how it's lost her the support of one very specific group of voters in Pueblo, Colorado. Enjoy. It's March 1st, 2022, and President Joe Biden is giving his State of the Union address. My fellow Americans, last year, COVID-19 kept us apart. This year, we're finally together again. It's the first time since the pandemic that the speech is held in person inside the chamber of the House of Representatives. And all 535 members of Congress are in attendance to hear Biden discuss the war in Ukraine, inflation, the economy, and then an issue that's clearly very important to him personally, veterans. The president's son, Beau, was an Iraq war vet. In 2015, he died of brain cancer, which may have been caused by something that still haunts millions of veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, something called a burn pit. These burn pits that incinerate waste, the waste of war, medical and hazards material, jet fuel and so much more. And they come home, many of the world's fittest and best trained warriors in the world, never the same. But then the State of the Union takes an unexpected turn. Headaches, numbness, dizziness, a cancer that would put them in a flag draped coffin. I know. That voice you heard? That was Congresswoman Lauren Boebert drowning in the booze of her fellow representatives. But she didn't back down. She went on Fox News. Congresswoman, You got an enormous amount of heat. You were smeared in the media for breach of decorum. Uh, Why did you speak out during this speech as you did? Laura, it is never wrong to stand up and speak out for moms and dads who lost their children. And I want to remind everyone who may be concerned about me speaking up at the State of the Union that Joe Biden was 100% responsible for the deaths of the 13 brave service members we lost in Afghanistan. And last night, he took zero responsibility for it. So when Joe Biden started talking about flag draped coffins, I got fired up. The mother of one of those heroes lives in my district. She told me, Joe Biden killed her son. So you're darn right I spoke up. And if I could redo last night, I would absolutely do it again. It was pretty shocking for folks across the country to see a first-term legislator behave this way, to heckle the president on this of all issues. But as we learned last episode, this is exactly what Lauren Boebert's voters sent her to Congress to do. Regardless of what her fans wanted, though, the job description for a member of Congress is to legislate. So in today's episode, we're going beyond the on-camera antics. We're looking at what kinds of laws the celebrity MAGA warrior has actually passed or not, and what it all means for her constituents. This is Lauren Boebert, Can't Lose, Episode 3, a story about what happens when someone who doesn't seem to understand how Congress works actually has to legislate. I'm Bree Davies, host of CityCast Denver. And as always, I'm joined by our producer, Paul Caroli. Good morning, Bree. So we're talking about what Boebert has actually done as a congressperson. How are we going to tackle this? Well, we could talk about how many times she's tried to impeach Biden or the time she called a fellow member of Congress a terrorist. But I wanted to find an example of how her decisions have actually impacted the lives of her constituents. So we're going to get really, really specific and talk about an issue that's deeply personal to one community in her district. 
Let's talk about Pueblo. Okay. You might remember Charles Ashby's voice from the last episode of this podcast. He's a veteran reporter with the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel and the most respected political journalist in the district Bobert represents. Why is Pueblo important to Congressional District 3? So Pueblo has always been the key to any race, at least recently, in recent elections, the last 10, 20 years. Charles explained that that's because Puebloans have the increasingly rare capacity to change their minds. They are unique voters. They could go left or right, even though they're mostly Democrat or largely Democrat. Um, a good example is that they voted for Trump, I think, the last two election cycles, even though they're Democrats. Pueblo is one of the biggest cities in Colorado's Congressional District 3, with a population a little over 100,000. And after seeing her actually do the job in Congress for two years, a whole bunch of those Puebloans changed their minds about her. 10,000 fewer people voted for her the second time. So that was my question. Why did so many Puebloans change their minds? I talked to about a dozen conservatives in Pueblo, many of whom loved Bobert at first, and eventually found a cybersecurity engineer who helped me understand one big way she let Pueblo down. So I'm Paul Hendrickson. I'm, I'm a eight-year veteran of the United States Army. I fought in Iraq and Afghanistan for uh, 15 months apiece. Um, I did both long-distance uh, reconnaissance. That was what I did in Iraq. And then on the Afghanistan side, I was a heavy weapons squad leader and platoon sergeant. Long-distance reconnaissance is another way of saying he was a sniper. So like you and a few other dudes going out, like in the middle of the night. Snooping and pooping, yep. After his two tours overseas, Paul re-enlisted at Fort Carson, a huge army base in southern Colorado. He decided to settle just outside Pueblo. It was a 30-minute drive from the base, and cost of living was low. Truth be told, Pueblo, I've always kind of, you know, said, ah, oh, you know, it's kind of podunk and not well to do, and, you know, it, it just was what it was. But uh, it's got the amenities that you need. It's got some name brand fast food. <laughs> it's got a Lowe's uh, and a Walmart and a Sam's Club. It's not that bad. Can I just say, I love Pueblo so much. I know. I feel the same way. The food is great. The people are great. They just redeveloped their downtown riverfront a few years ago, and it's great now, too. One of my best friends, David, grew up there in one of the many Chicano families that helped build the city. He told me about how Pueblo boomed 100 years ago when they built a big steel mill. The mill's owner was once the biggest employer in the state, attracting all sorts of Italian and Eastern European immigrants. The steel market crashed in the 80s, and Pueblo's been slowly recovering ever since. But I kind of learned to fall in love with it, and fly fishing here is just phenomenal. Paul eventually got used to the small town feel, but he told me his first few years in Pueblo were really tough. He said it felt like things from the army started catching up with him, things that hadn't seemed that important before, like the burn pits that we heard about earlier in Biden's State of the Union. Back in Iraq and Afghanistan, Paul was one of the millions of vets who tossed all kinds of refuse in burn pits, from old air conditioning units and feces to used medical supplies and tires. He just got up and dealt with it. He went to the gym and worked out in the same smoke, and then he took a shower in the same smoke, and then he ate in the same smoke, and then he'd go get your guys and get the briefing and the smoke, and he just dealt with it. It's just what it was. Paul is now among the many vets, like Bo Biden, whose long-term health effects have been linked to years of inhaling that acrid smoke. He told me he takes a steroid for his lungs because he has this wheezing that he never had before. It, it was frustrating and, and challenging to kind of come to grasp of that because it was a sub-30 minute five-mile runner, if that tells you anything. I mean, I, I would just go and I enjoy it. It's a, for me, it's a euphoric feeling to run. And now it's a challenge to make it three miles. Not because my body can't take me, it's because my lungs literally cannot keep up anymore. When you get out, you're, you're lost. And um, I suffered from heavy alcoholism. So much so that I was hospitalized. I was on the verge of dying. Um, I've since turned my, my depression and anger and frustration with helping veterans overcome obstacles, fight substance abuse, to turn their attention towards productive means to an end. Paul eventually found a support group of other vets. Over the years, he became a leader in the community. And because this is Pueblo, that means he also became something of a player in local politics. I want to ask you about veterans specifically. How important are veterans and the veteran vote to Pueblo? 
<laughs> it's just about the whole thing. This is Sarah Espinoza Blackhurst. She helped me understand why people like her friend Paul Hendrickson really matter in Pueblo politics. I don't know of anyone, I couldn't tell you a single person that I know that does not have a veteran in their family. It's so a part of that culture, but we hold that duty to our veterans sacred in this community. Sarah is a sixth generation Southern Coloradan from one of those old Chicano families like Bree's friend David. Sarah currently serves as the president and CEO of Action Colorado, a public policy group that focuses a lot on mostly issues important to rural Southern Colorado, which are typically conservative veterans issues. So again, I think, uh, I think you've got to understand Pueblo, and this is how I describe it. Pueblo politics, you need a navigator, an interpreter, and some security. I got the sense from Sarah that she's helped Paul navigate a few tricky situations over the years, and she often plays one of those roles for people coming to Pueblo to get work done, like their former congressman, Republican Scott Tipton. But she also meets frequently with aspiring politicians, like the owner of a certain gun-themed restaurant who challenged Tipton in 2020. So it's probably not a fair first impression because... I was a huge, huge fan of Scott Tipton's. So at first I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked that Lauren Boebert won the primary. But then I was like, well, you know, this is the job. We've got to work together. I had somebody invite me to go down. She was meeting with donors and they invited me to go along with her. And, you know, she's, she is a very attractive little, you know, she's a lady, she's very petite, she's attractive. She, you know, she's got a bubbly personality. You know, she's, she's kind of like, you know, she's running for homecoming queen. To tell you the truth, after I met her for the first time, I was like, oh my gosh, she is going to get eaten up. She's not at all ready to do the job. She's not ready to be a congressperson. And this is not going to go well. What gave you that impression? You know, being a congressperson is a really big job and it's a really important job. And we need our congresspeople to be very well engaged. Um, and she was really very concerned about her dress, that it, there was a wrinkle in the wrong place or something. But there was something about her that I was like, OK, um, you know, she, she can develop, right? She can become you know, she can grow into the role. So it wasn't that I wasn't, I was unimpressed. I just, I felt like this was a train wreck about to happen. Coming up after a quick break, Bobert makes a big show of standing up for veterans and Paul Hendrickson definitely wasn't impressed. Train wreck imminent. This episode is brought to you by the Museum of Outdoor Arts. The summer comes alive with a dynamic lineup of events during the Museum of Outdoor Arts Marjorie Park Uncorked series, featuring live music and artful entertainment. The Sculpture Park also hosts candlelight concerts and Rock the Block, a special series of live community lunch shows. The Museum of Outdoor Arts has teamed up with pioneering immersive artist Lonnie Hansen to bring you his newest permanent installation, The Cabinet of Curiosities and Impossibilities, immersing viewers in historic artifact collections, one-of-a-kind art pieces, and wonders that will surprise and delight your imagination. Many events are free and open to anyone, and you're invited to bring your own picnic. For a full schedule of events and more information, visit moaonline.org slash events. That's moaonline.org slash events. This episode is brought to you by Central City Opera. Central City Opera's Summer Festival is almost here. Don't miss your opportunity to experience exceptional musical theater and opera in the intimate and historic 550-seat Central City Opera House just 35 miles west of Denver. This year, their summer festival includes Pirates of Penzance, Girl of the Golden West, and Street Scene. The Central City Opera Festival runs from June 29th to August 4th with tickets starting at just $31 and they are going fast. You can find tickets and a performance schedule at centralcityopera.org slash citycast. Book tickets by June 30th and use the code CITYCAST at checkout for 20% off all performances after July 18th. Again, book using the code CITYCAST at centralcityopera.org slash citycast. 
Paul, we've been talking about veterans in this small city in southern Colorado called Pueblo, where a lot of people voted to send Lauren Boebert to Congress in 2020. But you just promised a train wreck? Yes, but we have to go back to March 2022, which was the beginning of an election year for Boebert. That meant it was time for her to remind all those people who voted for her in 2020 why she was still the one for the job which she chose to do by heckling the president during his State of the Union address. One of those, one of those soldiers was my son, Major Bo Biden. By the way, what she was yelling in that moment was apparently 13 bodies in reference to 13 service members who died during the American military withdrawal from Afghanistan. Here's a clip from Denver's local CBS affiliate about what happened next. Despite the intense criticism today, some people say all this attention is exactly what Boebert was after. And they would be right. She's using that outburst last night to raise money today. Boebert seems to thrive on shock value. She's been making waves since she got to D.C. last year. But even but then this is the part most people forgot about. After the outburst and the rage bait headlines and the hoopla, Congress had work to do. Because what Biden was trying to say before he was interrupted was that there was some legislation he was deeply invested in. I'm also calling on Congress to pass a law to make sure veterans devastated by toxic exposure in Iraq and Afghanistan finally get the benefits of the comprehensive health care they deserve. That bill was known as the PACT Act. It was meant to vastly expand the health care available to millions of veterans. And it had been gaining support at the time because supporting vets is typically something our elected officials can agree on. And who doesn't want an easy win in an election year? So it wasn't much of a surprise when just two days after the speech, the House passed the PACT Act with bipartisan support. But Boebert, who had just heckled the president on this exact issue, voted no. So did when... um, When she voted against the PACT Act, did you hear about it? (laughs) We we did. Um, I got phone calls. I got I got uh, and it's not because we can do anything about it. But um, I think for the people that we work with, they understand that um, we're going to listen to their voice. So, of course, I had people who are veterans that are we're very close to that, you know, would call me and write, you know, will you listen to this letter before I send it up and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, that was a really big deal. And some of the strongest voices for the veteran community here were enraged. And one of those voices, of course, belonged to Paul Hendrickson. Like I said before, it's about trolling people and owning the libs for her. It's not about the actual political duties that she has. It makes a mockery of our institution. And for me, it, it makes me ashamed to be an American sometimes. Um, it's frustrating. And especially when we get down to veterans issues, and knowing how close to the uh, the wire we were with the PACT Act and how much it would have affected veterans on a regular basis, it was frustrating and insulting. That's really all I have to say about that. You've heard enough from Paul Hendrickson at this point to know for sure that that was not all he has to say about that. In fact, he couldn't stop talking about it. I heard about him from a few different people I talked to from Pueblo independently. And as word was spreading around the veteran community, the Republican primary was heating up. Good evening and welcome to this candidate forum. My name is Sarah Blackhurst, and I'm here with you tonight from Pueblo, where I live and work as the CEO. On June 8th, just a few weeks ahead of primary day, Boebert faced off with her only opponent for the first time. Don Corum was a well-respected, old-school Republican with tons of experience in state government. You say you don't believe in earmarks. Well, maybe not. But if you don't take them, that doesn't mean the money is saved. It means it goes back to somebody else. And in his closing statement at that debate, Corum hit her hard on veterans issues. Let's let's talk about uh, the Denver Broncos. They've got a new quarterback. Uh, Let's just say, how's the new owner going to be if that new quarterback comes in and throws 50 pass attempts with no completions? And that's what we're dealing with with this with the current congressman. She throws a lot of passes. She takes a lot of credit. She takes credit for things that she voted against. Uh, As an example, she just a few minutes ago talked about how she supported the veterans. But I just saw a thing last week uh, where at a a thing you said, health care of the veterans wasn't your problem. It is your problem. You are the representative. Boebert still insists that she's been a strong advocate for veterans throughout her time in Congress. But I had a hard time finding an explanation for why she voted against the PACT Act. 
The only comment I could find was from a local TV station, KKCO. Boebert sent them a statement a few days after the vote in which she accused then-Speaker Nancy Pelosi of bringing a bad version of the bill. She reportedly said, quote, Politicizing a bill that addresses the health care of veterans is a new low for House Democrats, which sounds like a deflection to me and certainly wasn't satisfying for people like Paul Hendrickson. So other than just her choice to fundraise on her State of the Union interruption, it wasn't clear what she meant. And according to the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel's Charles Ashby, Boebert was having that problem a lot at this time. The first two years was pretty rough working with her campaign, with her not campaign, but by then her office, um, because they, they would, for example, send out a press release and then you would oftentimes write back and ask a question so you can do a story and they wouldn't respond. For someone who's not a journalist, is that normal? No, it's not normal at all. It's like, you put out this press release, you obviously want coverage on this. I'm willing to give you coverage, but I just have some other questions. And then they wouldn't respond. But none of that stopped Boebert from beating Don Corum, though, right? She smoked him. Corum had only started campaigning late, and clearly Boebert still had a lot of support. Corum is also the kind of Republican that's out of fashion now. He believes in personal freedom so much that he supports abortion access. So yeah, she beat him by like 25 percentage points. You guys have been so incredible from the very beginning. I didn't realize we'd have such an early night. Maybe I should have. Now remember, this was a heavily Republican-leaning district, and she didn't seem to sense the growing discontent in Pueblo. So she sounded confident she'd be able to cruise to another victory in November. But I want you all to know, I haven't looked at the Democrat tally yet. I don't really care. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It never mattered which Democrat won the primary because I've seen the Democrats that go to Washington, D.C. They don't work for you. They work for Nancy Pelosi. But she was wrong. It did matter who the Democrat was because the Democrat who she was going to face could tell she was vulnerable. Adam Frisch was a former city council member from affluent Aspen, and he really understood the assignment. According to the Colorado Sun, Frisch logged 23,000 miles driving across the district, meeting people, shaking hands. He ran to the center, called her out for all the angertainment, and said he just needed to convince some centrist conservatives that he was a, quote, safe enough choice to make them walk across the street. And he did that with veterans. Exactly. They sacrificed and risked their lives for America. I don't want a handout, just the health care I was promised. Lauren Boebert broke her word to vets. As your congresswoman, it is not my role to keep you healthy. Boebert voted against veterans' health care. And against helping vets sick from burn pits. It is not my role to keep you healthy. Boebert turned her back on us. You can't trust her. I'm Adam Frisch. I approve this message to respect our veteran service. Still, none of the experts expected Frisch to have a real shot, but he kept pounding on this one vote. At both of the debates I watched, he hammered it home. But at the end of the day, and the votes show and the facts show that uh, in veterans' bills, uh, which are a lot to do with health care, including the PAC Act, which expanded VA health care benefits for veterans exposed to burn pits, uh, Representative Bolbert turned that down and the PAC Act, as she has for 80%, of all the bills in her term that had to do with veterans. And most of those veterans' bills had to do with health care. By election day, Boebert was in trouble, even though the experts still didn't see it coming. When early results came in, it was neck and neck. The race was so close, it went to a recount. And in the end, Frisch did beat Boebert in Puebla, but she still came out on top, winning a second term by only 546 votes. The difference for her in particular between uh, 2022 versus 2020. What do you think happened? Well, because people got a better sense of who she was and who she was as a, as a legislator. Because before that, they didn't, she had no record. And it's easier to run when you have no record. You can say whatever you want, and people will either believe you or not. Once again, this is Charles Ashby, veteran politics reporter for the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel. I mean, for example, Pueblo has always been big. I, I can tell you this firsthand because I did this in the legislature, whatever government money they can get, any grants, or whatever, you know, they would be clamoring they could, because they always felt themselves as the redheaded stepchild um, to Colorado Springs. They hate Colorado Springs because in Colorado Springs, they have this saying, flush twice for Pueblo. They don't like that. 
right? <laughs> and so they would always want to make sure that they were getting whatever money was available. And the same is true with the with the federal government. But Boebert wasn't going after earmarks. In Boebert's first term in Congress, the Democrats were in control of the House, and not a single one of her bills passed into law. But in the same election, Frisch almost beat her in 2022. The Republicans won back the majority, and Boebert seems to have learned a lesson. She changed her mind oh. Oh, after her second, after she, she almost lost her second term. The first two years, she wasn't bringing any bacon home. And that hurt her a lot. And now she's all over it. Boebert actually tried to make a few big changes after the 2022 election. Number one, she introduced a bill in April to finally bring home some bacon. The Pueblo Jobs Act was meant to fund the long-promised cleanup and redevelopment of Pueblo's old chemical depot and, according to her, create at least a thousand jobs. And number two, she fired her press secretary and hired some new people. They got her out there talking to the press, like this interview with Stephanie Rule on MSNBC about Boebert's stance in the fight to pick a new Speaker of the House. Look at your last election. Mm -hmm. You represent a red district that Donald Trump handily won, and you won narrowly. And the takeaway for the entire midterms is that the country said, we are done with hyperpartisanship. And what you're doing today is blocking your own party. Is that what your voters asked you to do? So what I hear back at home all the time from my constituents is they're furious about what the Democrats have been doing all of this time. They're furious about the border crisis, the energy crisis, the historic inflation, and so much more. And the new team, Boebert, was clearly trying to reshape her image into that of a serious legislator. Quote, Lauren Boebert ditches the MAGA thing in Colorado, was the headline of a September profile in Politico full of quotes from her allies talking about how she was learning how to govern. And even Democratic Colorado Senator John Hickenlooper was talking about how he'd started working with her on some new bills. But Adam Frisch was already starting to fundraise like crazy for the 2024 election, and Team Boebert knew that she was going to need to rebuild her relationship with voters in her district, which meant she needed to go back to Pueblo. She knew she was in trouble with the veterans. There was a meeting that she was going to have, and, and I knew about it because, again, you know, like friends with Paul Hendrickson and several others. Bobert put the call out to veterans groups over the summer of 2023. She wanted to clear the air. So Paul Hendrickson and a bunch of his buddies showed up to the Pueblo Chamber of Commerce for a town hall on military affairs, but essentially a confrontation with their congresswoman, who they thought betrayed them. You could tell they came for combat, right? They wanted to come to fight if they had to. Um, they weren't there to really make this town hall well known. And they also kept it very quiet and secret. They didn't want a lot of people there. I wasn't there for the meeting because I wasn't invited, but she started talking about like all the work she'd done for veterans in Pueblo. That made these guys even angrier. And they had like a three page list of things that she'd voted against veterans on. She was very jittery. She couldn't hold a conversation. She couldn't hold a sentence. She couldn't stay on topic. And it was very obvious in her voice that she was shaky and nervous. Um, even with the Republican National Committee or the Republican Pueblo RNC equivalent, whatever they are, that was there really championing her. Uh, they even started getting really quiet and concerned with her responses, especially when talking specifically about veterans issues. But, you know, my friend was sitting there and I'm looking at him and he's very politically tied in. And you can see his eyes kind of widen every once in a while, like, are you serious? And Everybody knew after listening to her that she was lying through her teeth, telling us that she voted and she supported vets. But anybody that had any idea of her voting record was like, You're, you just straight up voted against that. And you just told me that you voted for it. So it, it kind of got stale and everybody just kind of lost interest in her. And not for the lack of having anything to say. It was more because she was just boring and didn't have anything really to contribute. It's very obvious that she wasn't well read into even the basic legislation that impacted the very industry and area that she was serving. It was the temperature didn't turn down on that um, after that meeting. I think everybody walked away just more frustrated than ever. In July 2023, the House voted to attach Boebert's Pueblo Jobs Act to a must pass military funding bill, which included a bunch of other provisions that Boebert hated like military support for abortion access and funding for a military chief diversity officer, according to the Pueblo chieftain. When that big bill went before the House for another vote in December, Boebert broke with the rest of her hard-right Freedom Caucus and voted for it. 
She told the chieftain that she had, quote, learned in this job, you do not always get what you want. But sometimes you have to make these compromises in order to make some changes as opposed to none. President Biden signed the bill on December 22nd, 2023, and to date, it remains the only bill she has ever solo sponsored that's become law. Without being too rude, I, I wouldn't say that she learned. Uh, she's playing the game. It's not about veterans' rights. It's not about Southern Colorado rural communities. It's not about advocating for you know, more funding and job opportunities for our constituents. It, it was all about just her agenda to own the libs type of mentality. All the crap that you see on pundit TV shows and entertainment news agencies, they just kind of make it a game. And it's not about progress. I felt that when speaking with her. I truly don't believe it was ever about progress, especially when it came to veterans issues. She would walk all over the flag if it's gonna get her to her next step. And that's exactly how I felt when I was talking to her. Paul Hendrickson never got another chance to express his frustration with Boebert at the ballot box because at the very end of 2023, she announced that she would not be running to represent Pueblo and Congressional District 3 again in 2024. Sarah, is there any chance that you think she could have won if she had stuck around in CD3 and not switched districts? If she would have stayed in 3, no, she wouldn't have won it. She was not going to be down fresh. When somebody comes to you and they say, this is my biggest concern, this is what I'm most concerned about, and they say, your concerns aren't real, how would that make you feel? Are you going to lose a vote right there? Yeah, you are. That's what was happening in Pueblo. That's why that switch happened. But of course, that's not the only reason why Bobert switched districts. Because just as she was trying to change her narrative and win back the people she'd lost, she got kicked out of a theater and it was all anyone could talk about for months. Five months off and we are back. I am so excited to be here. I am so excited. Seriously, I, I'm more excited than a guy seeing Beetlejuice with Lauren Boebert. <laughs> Next time on Lauren Boebert Can't Lose. It was somebody in the orchestra who told me and said, uh, hey, Lauren Boebert got kicked out of a performance over the weekend. And my first thought was like, that's probably not true. I don't know. But if it is true, we should probably check it out. It was true. But what exactly happened inside that theater? And what does it matter anyway? Boebert says she was escorted out just for laughing and singing too loud. As they used to say, let's go to the videotape. This has been Lauren Boebert Can't Lose, a production of CityCast Denver, where you can find me and Paul every day talking about the latest news and culture in Denver, Colorado. You can learn more about us and this special series at denver.citycast.fm. See you next time. No!